Okay, there we go. Yeah, I'll take it. Thank you. It is good to be together this morning and so glad you're here. We have visitors with us and we're thankful that, that you're here on this beautiful spring morning to be together to worship God. We're in Acts chapter 11. Love to have you join me there. Acts chapter 11. I'm not sure that the grace of God isn't the most abused topic in the religious world today. In the same way, I'm not sure that the grace of God is the most unused topic in the world of religion today. So what I'm looking for this morning is I'm looking for a church with God's grace. Here's what I know. Your Bible and my Bible says in Ephesians 2 in verse 8, it is by grace that we have been saved. It is not of ourselves. It is a gift of God. It is by grace through faith that we have been saved, and that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, lest any man should boast. If you and I are going to go to heaven this morning, we are only going to go to heaven thanks to the grace of God. Don't miss it. If you ain't going to use it, you ain't going to make it. Well, let me also advise you this morning that there are people who are going to miss heaven having abused the grace of God. I'm looking for a church that understands what God's grace is and is able to accurately apply the grace of God to life. And I start this morning with this idea of a fingerprint. Since 1908, in our country, we have been using fingerprinting to identify people. What we've learned is that God is so awesome that he can make all of our thumbs different. And there is no two alike. And so you were either at the scene of a crime or you were framed if your fingerprint is there because nobody else's looks like yours. I use that to start our thoughts this morning just to say from an identification standpoint, there is nothing that identifies you better than your thumb, than the print from your finger. In other words, if I were to ask you if you were male or female, well, there would only be two answers there, and that would put you in one group or the other, but it would still be two big groups this morning. I were to ask you if you're in your 30s or your 40s or your 50s, well, that would identify you, but it would identify you with the rest of the 30s or 40s or 50s. And that could still be a pretty good-sized group of people. But if I were to ask you to lay your thumb in an ink pad and put it on paper, that would only identify you with one person in this building or in the world for that matter, and that's you. Fingerprints identify. And so I'm asking you this morning, what identifies us as the Lord's church? As we think about grace and as we think about the religious world and how some use and some don't use and some abuse the idea of grace, what identifies us? And if your first thought in your mind is that sign out there in the yard, you, you, you best be careful, okay? Because I realize there's a sign out there, and it says at the top of it, in white letters with a blue background, Leoma Church of Christ. And here's my fear this morning is that instead of using that as an identification, or, or rather instead of an ownership, we use it simply as an identification. In other words, what I mean by that is that far too often today this idea of the church of Christ 
is used in a denominational kind of way which puts the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in a basket with all other religious bodies. And what I'm saying to you is that we need to be very careful that we're not just using that term as an identification, but rather understanding that it is a belonging. It is an ownership. It is a fingerprint that identifies us as supposed to at least as being owned by the one whose name is on that sign out there, Jesus. The church that belongs to, that has ownership from the Son of God. It's more than identity. It is more than classification. It is a unique print because Jesus only promised to build one and I want to be a part of that one. Your fingerprint is only one and there's only one like it. I want to be identified, classified by the one to whom owns me and to which I belong. So what does that look like? In Acts chapter 11, the church at Antioch had really started some pretty cool things and, and, and report gets back to Jerusalem about what's going on in Antioch. And so who better to send to Antioch than old Barnabas? And so the brethren in Jerusalem, the apostles, decide, hey, we're going to send Barnabas down to investigate what's going on in Antioch. I want you to notice when he first gets there in Acts 11 and verse 23, the first thing that he sees, when he, when he walks into the building, when he, when he comes in to the, to the family of God at Antioch, and he says, okay, I want to identify you people. I want, to, I want to see what, who you belong to and, and what ownership you are claiming. When he comes in, what's the first thing he sees? He sees the grace of God. I, I, want, to, I want to be very clear this morning. And, and I want to be identified. I want to show ownership in the grace of God. If, if somebody is coming to this church, do they feel, understand, see, are they able to apprehend the grace of God? When Barnabas gets to Antioch and, and, he, and he sees the people, the first thing he sees is the grace of God. And his heart is made merry. He is gladdened by that and he exhorts them all. He encourages them all to continue with a steadfast purpose with heart in the mission. And so what we have in Antioch is we have a church that clearly has the grace of God. It's the first thing that Barnabas sees when he gets there. And here's my fear, church. My fear is, is that we keep the grace of God so far pushed down that we're scared to allow people to see it. And then there may be other religious bodies that hold it up over everything else so that's all you can see. I've got to believe that somewhere in the middle there's a balance that is desired by God and that's what I'm looking for in the church. A church that understands and appreciates God's grace. When Barnabas gets to Antioch, the first thing that I would call your attention to is that these people were teachers of God's grace. There was a joke within our marriage for a while there. For those of you that don't know, I tried out four or five places before I came to Leoma. And 
And, and it, for those of you that don't know, you, you know how it is when you go to do an interview, okay? You, you put on your favorite outfit to go do an interview, and, and you try to look the best you can look, okay? Well, now take that mentality and come in to my world of ministry. So when you go to try out, you, you take your favorite sermon, all right? So bless her heart, my wife had heard this sermon to the point that now every time I say, guess what I'm preaching on Sunday? She'll say, grace. Well, that was a joke for a while. It, it is one of my favorite sermons because I, I do love to teach from Ephesians. I love to teach about the grace of God. I want to understand the grace of God. I want to appreciate and to be able to validate the grace of God within my life. And I want people to see God's grace working in me as I teach. It's not something we need to be fearful of. It's, it's something that we need to explain to people biblically so that they can come to an appreciation of what God has done and how gracious He is. In Acts chapter 11 and verse 20, there were some of them listing men of Cyprus and Cyrene who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also. Now remember, in Acts chapter 10, we, we, we're just now getting to these, to these Greeks. We're, we're just now getting to this Gentile world. And so this is all new for us. And, and, and the Jews are, are really having a, a hard time to overcome this barrier and this wall that had been there for so many generations. But these men come and they're and they're doing what? They're preaching the Lord Jesus. What report did they get in Jerusalem about Antioch? Let me tell you what report they got. They got a report that the, the church in Antioch was growing. They got a report in Jerusalem that the church in Antioch was having Hellenistic converts. They got the report that the Lord was adding to the body there, and so they want to send Barnabas to go investigate it. And when he gets there, what he finds out is that men have been coming to Antioch to teach. To teach what? To teach Jesus Christ. That's what verse 20 says. But I would infer to you from verse 23, somewhere along the way, if Barnabas is going to see the grace of God, the grace of God had to be taught. These people had to accept what they were being taught about, not only about Jesus, but about the grace that God has displayed through what Jesus has done. They were teachers of God's grace. In verse 26, and when they found him, when Barnabas found Saul, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year they met with the church and they taught a great many people. I'm looking for a church that is willing to teach others about the grace of God. Because here's what I know. I know that in today's world there are still people who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They're still out there. They're still around us. They want to know the truth. They want to know about God. They want to know of His love. They want to know about the sacrifice. of They are hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Are we going to fill them? Are we going to be teachers specifically of God's grace and how God desires because of His graciousness to save and forgive all? He desires that. He wants to do that. He wants to fill you with righteousness. As I think about Acts chapter 17, just a couple of pages over, those in Berea, verse 11, were more, more noble than those in Thessalonica. Why? Because they searched the Scriptures daily. 
They studied the scriptures. They examined the scriptures so that they could find out whether the things were so. Why? Because they wanted to teach them. They wanted to be able to tell someone else. Study, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15 says, in the King James Version, to show thyself approved to God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly handling or dividing the word of truth. Be able to handle, to divide, to teach, to know where to use and not abuse. To know what God has said and what He's commanded, what He's made available. Are we able to teach? These people in Antioch were getting taught God's grace. How long is it going to be before someone comes to meet with the church here? Before they realize that God is, God is gracious. When are they going to be taught that? How long will it take? Which chapter will it be in? How long will they have to stay before they understand the grace and the fact that it is available upon their souls. Not only were they teachers, but then secondly, I want you to notice they were tools for God's grace. In Acts chapter 11 and verse 26 there, at the very end, and in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now you say, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, if you'll understand the word disciple and understand the word Christian and understand the definition behind both, maybe you'll see the big deal in all of it. A disciple. One who is following after patterning one's life because of. A disciple. One who is allowing themselves to be mentored by another. A disciple, one who is being taught and trained by the Master. Can I suggest to you that we, we love the word Christian, and I'm okay with the word Christian, but let me tell you, followers of Jesus were disciples long before they were Christians, meaning they were followers. They were being mentored they were submitting to the direction of the Master. They were modeling or patterning their life after the leader. Disciples. I'm okay with the word Christian. I'm okay with you calling yourself a Christian if, in fact, you belong to Christ. If, in fact, in Christ you are, then and only then do you or I have the right to wear the name of Christ. Can we be Christians? Absolutely. But in order to be Christians, we must be a reflection of the light. Jesus said in John 8 and verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Do you and I, as tools of God's grace, reflect the light of Jesus? It's a simple question for a personal answer. Am I a reflection? Jesus says it this way in Matthew 5, that we are the light of the world. Beginning in verse 14, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a basket. But they set it on a lampstand that it might give light to all that are in the house. Verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. If in fact I am a Christian, my life is lived reflecting Jesus so that God might be glorified so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Am I a tool of 
God's grace. Jesus made a promise in John 12 and verse 32, didn't he? He made a simple promise. If you and I will lift him up, he'll draw all men unto himself. If you and I will become tools of the grace of God, helping others to see Jesus through us, if we're going to wear the name Christian, then it is in Christ that we live, just like those in Antioch. When Barnabas got there, he saw the grace of God. Why? Because they were utilizing themselves as tools of God's grace. And then finally, I want you to see at the end of this passage, as Chuck read it a moment ago, that they were totally selfless with God's grace. Look at verse 29 again. Agabus comes and reports to them that a famine is going to happen. And just like we saw early in the book of Acts, here we see again, they determine everyone according to his, his own ability to send relief to those living in Judea. And they did so, verse 30, sending it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Interestingly enough, in Acts 11 and verse 30, just as a sidebar, this is the first time you see the idea of elders in action. And so what we have here is we have a transition from the apostles to the, to the elders. We're sending relief not to the apostles like we were in Acts chapter 4 and laying it at the apostles' feet, but now we're sending money, we're sending relief to the elders for them to see that the needs of the famine are met. We've got a transition going on in the church because we know that the, elder, that the apostles are going to die eventually. And so God in His wisdom, in His organization of the church, what I want you to see is those in Antioch totally selfless. They, they, they hear of a need and, and, and the first thing they do is they say, you know what, we want the people in Judea to know that we are God's disciples because we have love for those brethren. And Jesus said in John 13 and verse 35, if you have love for one another, all men will know that you're my disciples. I think about those in Macedonia in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Those first five verses there, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, as Paul introduces those two chapters of 8 and 9 about being liberal and about being generous and about giving, he says of the Macedonians, they gave above and beyond their ability. Totally selfless with God's grace. Has God been gracious to me? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is God being gracious to me? Absolutely. Am I hoarding the grace of God within my own life? Well, that's a simple question with a personal answer. These people were not. Those in Antioch said, no way. No way are we going to hoard the grace of God now, I'll have to get Paxton up here or get Shannon Kelly up here to help me with this, but I'm going to try it, okay? It goes something like this, doesn't it, Paxton? Here's the church, and here's the steeple, and you open the door, and there's the people, right? Well, the problem is, is that one little boy was sitting in Bible class, the Truth For Today commentary tells, and he only had one hand. And the teacher began to do this little exercise. And it just so happened that one of the little girls in the class, she went over there and reached out her hand and she said to the little boy, she said, let's build the church together. 
That's the way it's supposed to work, isn't it? That's, that's what it's supposed to look like, right? That's selflessness. Where I realize and appreciate the grace of God to save my soul from its sins, and I want you to know. I want your help in building the church together. We're on trial here, aren't we? Oh, we don't like to think about it that way, but we are, aren't we? Every visitor that comes along, we're on trial, church. And as we think about what officers do and investigators do, they gather evidence one piece at a time. And it leads them to the next step. And if they can get those fingerprints, then they begin to identify people. And then they start putting the puzzle together one piece by piece, trying to identify who done the wrong and how they done it and what the motives were and, and what all the... I'm, I'm investigating you, church. I'm trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together to identify who you are. What I'm looking for is I'm looking for ownership. I'm looking for belonging. I know what your sign says out there, but is that really what it is? I know what your Sunday morning says, but, but is that really who you are? Where does the piece of the evidence come into play about the grace of God? And what am I going to know about that? I'm looking for a church that is willing to use the grace of God to teach it, to be tools of it, and to be totally selfless with it. How long would it be before someone could identify this congregation as a church that has the grace of God living under the identity of Christ? Your life's on trial. And you're given the evidence piece by piece. What am I concluding? What are they concluding? What are visitors concluding? When Barnabas, Acts 11 and verse 23, when Barnabas got to Antioch, the first thing he saw was the grace of God. You're trying to get to heaven without it this morning. It's a hopeless battle. You better be so thankful that His grace reaches you and me. Because of that, now, what are we going to do, church? Thanks to these people in Antioch, they didn't sit down and say, boy, we got the grace of God. It's all good now. We don't have to do anything. That would be the furthest lie from Acts chapter 11 that you could tell. Because they are doing something. They were doing something before Barnabas got there. Barnabas just joins in and goes and gets Saul. And they join task force with them to continue to do something. As a result of the grace of God. I'm begging you this morning to not render void the grace of God. Do something about it. Namely, get your soul right. So that you can go to heaven and thank God for His grace. We're on trial, church. And the judge is going to hand down the verdict. He's looking for a fingerprint. There's only one. And it's unique. It's the fingerprint of Jesus. Is it on you? If not, would you come right now?